Today we're going to talk about prejudice. Woo! Prejudice. Get excited to judge people. A prejudice is a negative attitude towards all members of a distinguishable group based solely off of their membership in that group. So let's say I met somebody who was of a specific demographic, right? And I met this one person and I said, wow, this person is really mean. That doesn't mean that I'm prejudiced. It has to be an attitude that I have towards all members of that specific group. It's a pre-judgment. So if I meet somebody and they are of a specific demographic and I say, oh, I know they're going to be mean because all people like that are mean, that is a prejudice. And the issue with prejudices are that sometimes our prejudgments are inaccurate, right? We might judge somebody and our judgment might be wrong. And if you don't realize that your judgments can be wrong, then you're going to be more likely to misjudge people. So that's, that's prejudice. Yeah? Wow. I think we just solved racism. Now, a stereotype is a form of prejudice. It is a specific belief about the characteristics of a group. Uh, so let's say I had this assumption that certain people are a certain way. So, ooh, people who play video games, they're all fat and lazy, right? I can say that because I have a friend who plays video games. Uh, but not all people who play video games just stay home all the time and don't engage in any athletic ability. Not all of them live in their mother's basement. Some of them live in their grandmother's basement, right? Now, there are gamers who are very fit and very active. There are gamers who are not as fit and not as active. But there's a stereotype which leads to this prejudgment, right? I'm talking to somebody and they mention that they play video games. I'm like, ugh another gamer, right? And then I have all these stereotypes that come into play, even though I know lots of people who are exceptions to the rule. And sometimes what happens is this weird cognitive dissonance where people are aware that there are exceptions, but they still play into the stereotypes, which is why the argument of well, I can't be racist because I have a friend of this, uh, uh, I almost said denomination, uh, of this demographic uh, is flawed reasoning. Because if you still believe those stereotypes and you still play into them, you're making an exception for your friend, but you're still pe treating people like your friend uh, in, the, in this very specific way. So... If you have these stereotypes, if you have these prejudices, and they still lead to discrimination against everybody aside from the people who you've decided that you won't discriminate against, that's very problematic, right? I can still be very respectful to my mother and my sister and still be sexist, right? I might like uh, when I see a gay character on television, but still be very homophobic and discriminatory, right? Now, just to be clear, not me, I'm giving an example. I'm, I'm, I have lots of friends who are gay and women and black, so I'm not racist or sexist or homophobic. No, not me, not ever. So we have this fear of people who are different than us. It's this lack of understanding for difference because a lot of us are raised in a way that tells us that our way of life is the best way of life, right? People who behave in a way that's different than us are wrong and they need to be convinced that our way is the best. We can look at American ideas of democracy, right? If you say that, you know, America has best democracy and every other country has to do democracy exactly the same way that we do it, 
even though their way might work better for them, that's problematic. So we might be afraid of something that's different, sometimes just because it calls into question the validity of our own beliefs, right? If we think that our way is right, but someone else is doing something different and they seem happy, right? Well, one of us has to be wrong and it's definitely not us. We can't be wrong because this is the way we've been doing it for, you know, 200 years. Why would we ever want to change that, right? So they have to be wrong and we need to go out of our way to fix that, right? Uh, So a lot of racism and discrimination uh, and xenophobia comes from this idea that our way, especially when it's associated with like a nationality, has to be the only way, which is obviously flawed, right? Uh, the uh, There are, for example, 6,000, I believe, different Christian denominations. Uh, and that even that doesn't even... Uh, include like Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, right, Uh, which are major Christian denominations uh, that uh, exist outside of like the Protestant bubble, right? Now, these are 6,000 different ways of interpreting one religious doctrine. And that's you know that that adds to the the beauty of uh, a religion where uh, the same information can mean this, uh, different things to different people. But uh, what can happen is this feeling of superiority, right? Uh, this feeling that uh, things need to be uh, specifically followed to the letter of the law, which can oftentimes cause issues, right? So. Uh, we can see this in any uh, area. Uh, we have like this cultural, like regional, uh, like superiority with food, right? Uh, if you go to Philadelphia and you don't like Philly cheesesteaks, what's wrong with you? You're a terrible person. Uh, how do you like your pizza? Do you like it New York style or Chicago style? One style has to be better, but it doesn't have to be. We can live in a society where we have differences and we respect differences. I can enjoy deep dish. You can enjoy uh, the really thin crust. And there's nothing wrong with that. We enjoy what we enjoy and we, uh, uh, we appreciate the differences that exist in our culture. But we've often been raised that difference is bad and it has to be fixed, right? Uh, so this is the basis of racism and religious discrimination and xenophobia, this idea that anything that isn't what we know, anything that's different from how we were raised is problematic. It's tribalism, right? Uh, And we want our tribe to succeed to the detriment of other tribes. But it doesn't have to be that way. But that's the way a lot of us were raised. So sexism and gender uh, discrimination are pretty interesting topics because if you look genetically, uh, our, our sex chromosomes make up such a small percentage of who we are. Yet we focus so much on sex differences. And a lot of the sex differences that we see are just gender differences. Now, If you're not familiar with the distinction between sex and gender, sex is biological. So if you actually look in your genes, sex is what you are biologically. And that's based on more than just your uh, chromosomes. It's based off of hormones and how they aid in your development. Uh, Now, uh, we won't get too much into the biology of it, but uh, there are two main uh, chromosomal combinations that you might be aware of. Uh, XX and XY, but there are other combinations. There could be, uh, sorry, that's be an X and an O. You could have XXY, you could have XXYY. Uh, There are other combinations of sex chromosomes that are uh, less frequently seen, but still they're there, right? So sex is much more complicated of a topic than a lot of people might assume. It's not very clear cut. Sex is also determined by your hormones, the ones that were there 
when you're developing as a fetus and the ones that continue to be processed by your body as you're developing. So sex isn't super clear cut. Gender, as a result, isn't super clear cut because we determine how people of certain sexes should behave based off of the gender rules of society. But from society to society, those rules change. But we've been taught uh, how to behave based off of just being socialized, right? Maybe if you were a kid, somebody handed you a toy truck and you were like, okay, well, this is a toy that I'm going to play with. Or maybe you were playing with a toy truck and somebody took it away from you, right? Uh, And so you uh, go, oh, that's not what I'm supposed to play with, right? Uh, And we don't realize sometimes how aware of these gendered rules children, even at a very young age, are. I can remember uh, in kindergarten playing with toys uh, and just remembering, oh, I cannot play with those toys because those are girl toys, right? I can play with these toys because these are toys for me. I'm a boy, right? Uh, So even before puberty, we have these very specific gender roles. Uh, These are the colors that you wear. Uh, These are the toys that you play with. This is how you act. These are the types of games you can play. So when we're looking at sexism, when we're looking at prejudices and discrimination based off of sex, we're usually talking about hostile sexism, which is the, like, you know, mistreatment of women in the workplace or in school uh, and based off of the idea that women are less than. But sometimes sexism can be benevolent. Now, it sounds weird to describe something as benevolent, but sometimes our stereotypes have a positive spin, right? Uh, So if you have a whole bunch of people to choose from uh, to be on your basketball team, and one of them just happens to be African-American, you might assume that they might be the better basketball player, right? Uh, If you have, uh, uh, if you're choosing between that person and somebody who is uh, Japanese, uh, and it is a measure of of mathematics ability, your initial thought might be that the person who is Japanese might be significantly better, right? Uh, Even though the Japanese person might be a great basketball player and the African-American person might be a mathematician, right? But we have these stereotypes. So these benevolent stereotypes sometimes feel like they're okay because they're positive, right? the idea that somebody might be very good at something or be talented in one way or another. But one thing that this can lead to is the idea that uh, uh, people are limited to a specific role. So, uh, oh, this person is only good for this because they are of this race. Or the idea that if somebody's not great at this, then they're somehow less than right? Uh, women often experience the discrimination of uh, the, uh, the idea that women are inherently more nurturing. So if you are a woman and you are, don't feel like you're a great parent, right? Uh, if it doesn't feel natural to you, it uh, feels like you're a failure because women naturally are supposed to be great at nurturing and raising kids. It should be easy and automatic. There are never any teachable moments and there's never any room for growth. Just automatically from the gate, it's the easiest thing in the world, right? It's like riding a bike even though you've never learned how to ride a bike before, but that's not true. So benevolent sexism can lead to a lot of really negative consequences, even though the intention is, oh, look at these great things that are attributed with this specific demographic. We should also talk about homophobia, uh, heteronormativity, and transphobia. Try to say those three times fast. It is tough. Homophobia, heteronormativity, and transphobia. Homophobia, heteronormativity, and transphobia. Homophobia, heteronormativity, and trans... Ah, ah, I was so close. Uh, So, uh, the... uh, Based on the way that a lot of us were raised, we might have learned that a uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. Now, 
there's this very interesting thing that we do in society where we go, well, this is the way that things have been forever, so we cannot change it, right? Uh, now, dating and marriage have, even in the last hundred years, have changed multiple times, right? Um, when was the last time you heard about a dowry being offered uh, for a wedding? Uh, when was the last time parents arranged a wedding? Dating as an institution has barely lasted, like has barely been around for a hundred years. Back in the day, you would have gentlemen callers and you would have supervised dates at your home in front of your parents, right? The idea of taking people out and it just being the two of you uh, was often considered prostitution uh, by uh, police agencies because they said, well, this man is paying for uh, a woman's time by giving her these gifts, paying for amusement parks and things like that. So it must be prostitution. We don't think of it like that anymore. Also, sometimes women pay for the first date, right? Also, sometimes it's not a man and a woman going on a date, right? Our institutions change over time. And the idea that things can never change because they've always been a certain way is flawed because so many things that we once considered normal are completely different now, right? Uh, now it's considered normal to have a college degree when... 80, 90 years ago, having like a high school degree for some people wasn't even a necessity, right? You just go learn the trades. Now people are avoiding the trades and getting college degrees. Society changes. So the idea of what it means to be male, what it means to be female, and whether you need to cleanly define yourself as one or the other is changing because we realize that our, these two categories don't accurately reflect what people often feel. Same thing with uh, a sexual orientation. For a very long time, we thought that it was either one or the other, right? Uh, you were either attracted to men or women. And still, the idea of bisexuality for a lot of people seems odd. But the more we study sexual orientation and sexual attraction, we realize that it's a very complicated spectrum. There are multiple levels to sexual attraction, sexual arousal. So you might be able to see somebody and find them sexually attractive, but you might not have the desire to have sexual intercourse with them. Uh, or maybe you want uh, to kiss them, uh, but you have no interest in uh, having a romantic relationship with them, right? Uh, we separate different parts of sexual attraction. Uh, so then even within that, right, uh, there are even further uh, delineations. So uh, a lot of the issues in our society relating to sexual orientation and gender identity are just are, uh, are wanting to be fixated on the way things always have been, right? Uh, but things have changed. Uh, marriage, relationships, families change, right? Uh, uh, on the topic of families, the um, uh, divorce is much more prevalent than it used to be. And some people look at that as a sign of culture degrading and changing. Now, one thing to be aware of is even uh, some of our grandparents didn't really marry because they were madly in love. Uh, some of us might look at our grandparents and they might see like the relationship that our grandparents have is about as romantic as business partners or like roommates, right? They work together, they pay the bills, they sleep in the same house, but they're not very affectionate with each other. Because for people who were getting married in the 30s and 40s, uh, it wasn't really about romance. It was more so about building a family. It was a strategic partnership. Now we have some uh, people who 
uh, have grandparents who are madly in love and they're very cute and they kiss all the time and we're like, oh, grandma and grandpa, right? But also there are uh, grandparents who did not have that option. For a very long time, the only way for a woman to leave her parents' home was to get married. So you had the option of either staying home or being married. And with the lack of financial independence that uh, a lot of women can enjoy now, you couldn't just get a divorce. If you got a divorce, then you would be in a place of financial instability, right? So the reason uh, there are more divorces happening now is because uh, uh, the there's this ability for a lot of women to leave situations that are not healthy, right? So it's not that people don't respect marriage as much. It's that people are now able to get themselves out of problematic situations. So this uh, shift in how we think about uh, love, this thing, this shift in how we think about sex, this shift in how we think about marriage, right? Is it a partnership? Does it have to last forever? Can people change over time, right? Uh, that's changing our society. So in understanding that there are different expressions uh, of love and marriage uh, and partnership uh, and attraction, that allows us to understand that there can be these differences. Politics, right? Uh, it's the same sort of tribalism that we have seen in racism uh, and other uh, forms of like in-group, out-group identity. The idea is that we form our identities around these political affiliations, right? This is a very new thing in society. It most, like, a lot of us can't imagine being married to or dating somebody of a different political affiliation, but the past 20, 30 years have really changed how we think about political parties there's a lot more hate towards the other side. There's a lot more alienation. There's a lot more dirty fighting, right? Uh, there's this feeling of uh, America at war with itself. We've heard about states wanting to secede uh, or not necessarily the states themselves, but people within those states. There's a this desire to screw over the other side. Uh, so, once your party is in uh, the presidency, you make it harder for the other side to do their job. There's less willingness to compromise, right? Uh, the uh, identity politics are a really dangerous thing in American society because our government is founded on the idea that we need to compromise. And if there's this constant war and pettiness between sides, and there's no desire to understand the other side. And if we create these echo chambers where we never have to consider the other side's arguments uh, like uh, logically, uh, then and we never give any seriousness or uh, credibility to them, then we just create this very fragmented society. So this is really a, a great little microcosm of racism because you're born into a certain family and you're taught a specific set of values. Somebody else is born to a different family and taught a specific set of values. And when it comes to things that are like, you know, not uh, cut and dry, like for example, if you're taught racism, then like you're wrong. Uh, but like, when it comes to fiscal responsibility, how much debt is too much debt, right? Uh, some people are pro the elimination of uh, the federal deficit. Some people feel like a healthy level of debt is okay, right? Uh, now, obviously, from an economical point of view, a little bit of debt for a, uh, for a country is 
healthy, right? Uh, but how much we consider a healthy amount is going to depend right? Some people are going to be more fiscally conservative. Some people are going to be less fiscally conservative. But when we create our identity around these ideas, then anything that opposes that is attacking us personally. So now we're going to talk about a few types of discrimination. One type of discrimination, ageism. Right, The idea that people who are too young or too old are incapable of certain tasks. Right, uh, Some people say that uh, all old people are racist or all young people are uh, ignorant and selfish. Right, We see these generational uh, stereotypes, which some are true to some people in those groups, but not true to all people in those groups. Right, There are... Uh, millennials who are self-centered and entitled, but there are also millennials who are spending their entire lives in service of really wonderful causes, right? There are boomers who are racist and selfish. There are boomers who literally were part of civil rights movements in their youth and continue to fight for activist causes, right? So, the idea that somebody simply based on their age uh, is going to behave in a specific way is problematic. Uh, and we have to be careful about that uh, when it comes to hiring practices and just our assumptions about how other people are going to act. Then we have ableism. So uh, when we're talking about ableism, we're talking about when people have certain disabilities, uh, whether they be physical or mental, does it uh, affect their ability to do specific tasks? Now, sometimes it can, right? In very practical senses, sometimes there are limitations. Uh, if you are in a wheelchair, climbing stairs is going to be more difficult. That is why we create ramps and other methods of accessibility for people with uh, disabilities. The issue is when we assume that people with disabilities can't do anything, right? Uh, so I have, maybe I have a student with ADHD uh, and I say, well, you know, I might, I might not, I don't want to include them because they're not going to be able to pay attention in at all, right? That's ableist. Uh, that's me assuming that all my other students without ADHD are just, they're, they're definitely paying attention all the time. But my one student with ADHD, just because of their disorder, has no ability to do anything, right? Or significantly decreased ability. So this is just a, uh, another issue of the more you know people who are different than you, the more understanding you have. If my only experience with somebody with ADHD is like a cartoon that I saw and it's a person like jumping up uh, and down uh, off of the walls uh, like a, a, you know, super hyper person, right? I'm like, oh, that's what ADHD is like. No, that's probably not what it's like, right? So the more exposure we get to people who are different than us, uh, the more we understand these things and the less we rely on stereotypes. So prejudices can lead to discrimination. Discrimination uh, refers to the behaviors that we engage in based off of our stereotypes. If I run a store and some person of color walks in and I decide to follow them around my store, that is a form of discrimination. If I just go, oh, um, this person is probably gonna steal something, that is a prejudice. But once I actually act out, on that prejudice, I'm being discriminatory, right? Uh, we see this in hiring, we see this in housing. That's why there are federal laws protecting specific groups from discrimination. If you're a person of color, you might have a harder time finding a new place to live because of discrimination. If you are in any of these protected groups, uh, so uh, age or religion or 
uh, um, uh, uh, sexual orientation, uh, certain jobs may try to discriminate against you because of those things, which is why we have these laws in place to prevent that. So I have a question for you. Are you biased? Of course you are. We all have biases. I'm biased. You're biased. We're all biased. There are two types of biases that we have to deal with and we have to understand. They are explicit biases and implicit biases. Explicit biases are the ones that are very easy to express, right? I don't like spaghetti because uh, tomato sauce, like red sauces just don't, they taste weird to me. I've never had a red sauce that I've enjoyed, right? That is an explicit bias. Just so you guys know, I love spaghetti. Big fan. If you guys have some spaghetti, I will have some spaghetti. Uh, spaghetti time. Now, uh, implicit biases are a little bit harder to explain. Uh, I don't like mashed potatoes. Why don't you like mashed potatoes? I don't know. I just don't really like them, right? And it's like, well, what's wrong? Is it the, like, taste? I'm like, no, they taste fine. Is it the texture? It's like, no, I don't really have an issue with it. I just, like, don't eat them. I never want to, like, if they're on my plate, I'll, like, pick at them and have them. But, like, I don't really like mashed potatoes, right? It's much harder for me to explain why I don't like mashed potatoes. But I have an easier time explaining why I don't like spaghetti. So, when uh, you're dealing with biases, you can probably guess which are the harder ones to overcome. Implicit biases, because if there's an explicit bias, right, you can usually counter it with some sort of fact, right? Uh, oh, um, well, some uh, red sauces are tomato-based, but they have a squash-based uh, uh, spaghetti sauce. That's really delicious. I don't know if that's true, uh, but... Uh, Guys, let's make some uh, squash squash uh, spaghetti. Uh, so the uh, so those explicit biases are much easier to counter. Implicit biases, because they're so internalized, uh, they're much harder to deal with. When people aren't in your group, you're much more likely to be biased towards them. Right? You're much more likely to have those negative biases towards them. One fun thing that happens when you're talking about prejudice is scapegoating. Uh, you have heard this uh, because a lot of this has been happening recently, right? Uh, so the uh, recent uh, COVID-19 situation, we're blaming China, right? Uh, the economy, we're blaming uh, illegal immigration, right? Uh, the fact that uh, my uh, girlfriend doesn't love me anymore, uh, it's probably because of murder hornets. I hope that somebody listens to this in like three years and is just like, I remember more <laughs> murder hornets. They killed half of the population. We thought COVID-19 was bad, but we should have been worried about the murder hornets. Um, but scapegoating is when you find somebody who's usually not associated with the issue to blame for a specific issue, right? Illegal immigration isn't responsible for a lot of our job losses, right? Changes in the economy are. The more you outsource to other countries, the fewer jobs you'll need in your country, right? So people who are coming to the country in search of work aren't taking away jobs in the same way that taking an entire factory and then moving it to a different country is, right? Now, we don't have time to get into the economic pros and cons of outsourcing because we're just talking about scapegoating. But the issue is the scapegoat feels like an easy thing to point at and blame right? If I see uh, someone who seems like they're an illegal immigrant, I can point at them and say, you're the reason for my problems. And it gives me a very clear direction for my anger. It's very hard for me to point to a factory uh, like halfway across the globe and say, you're the reason to blame for my issues, right? Uh, so scapegoating is very effective and 
any lingering stereotypes or prejudices uh, are just inflamed by that scapegoat. Uh, so if I already didn't like uh, uh, quote unquote foreigners, right? Uh, and uh, I was already feeling xenophobic and someone says that those people are to blame, it just logically makes sense. So scapegoating is a very easy way to make people feel better about tough situations because we all want to be able to explain how we feel. And if there's an easy explanation, we're going to go for it. So here are some other issues with prejudice and discrimination, if there weren't enough already. One issue is when you are the victim of something that can be perceived as discriminatory. Uh, it's called attributional ambiguity, which is the inability to determine whether or not you're being discriminated against. So I go apply to a job. I'm a black male. I don't get the job. Now, I know I'm qualified. Maybe the person who got the job was more qualified than me. Maybe the person who got the job was less qualified than me but not the same race as me, right? Was I a victim of racism? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I was being discriminated against. If I am walking down the street late at night and somebody crosses to the other side of the street, well, do they cross because that's where their car was or that's where their home was? Do they cross because uh, they've been feeling sick and they didn't want to like, you know, uh, breathe gross air on me? Or did they cross because they thought that I was going to hurt them because I'm black? Or did they think that I was going to hurt them because I'm male? Which isn't discriminatory, right? Uh, if you see a strange uh, man uh, late at night on the street and you see a strange woman late at night on the street, uh, it is more likely that the man will be the abuser, right? Or the, uh, the um, assaulter. Uh, so... The, not to say that women don't commit crimes, uh, they do, but uh, if you're just going statistics and stereotypes, it's more likely that the male will be uh, a person who assaults you on the street, right? So if they are, so they might just see a male and not even clock the color of my skin and go, let me just walk around just to be safe. Maybe they do that for every person that they see, but I don't know whether it's an issue of my race or just the fact that I'm a strange human being on the street. So sometimes it's very hard to know if you're being a victim of some sort of prejudice and discrimination or if it's just that person's normal behavior. What can also happen is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I assume that people are going to have an issue with me based off my race or any other demographic. So I might act in a specific way. So I assume that uh, somebody's going to uh, think that I'm stealing. So in order to mess with them, right, because who are they to think that I'm going to steal? I'm going to pretend to put things in my pocket, right? Uh, I'm going to uh, like have my, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, like hold my coat over and be as suspicious as possible. I'll give them something to respond to. Now, that person always looks at everything or always looks at everyone who walks into the store. But now that I'm acting suspicious, they have more reason to judge me and they are more likely to behave in a discriminatory way. So because I thought that I was going to be perceived in a specific way, I've created a situation in which I'll be perceived in that way. That is a self-fulfilling prophecy. I've actually created my own situation in which I would be discriminated against, right? Stereotype threat is similar. It's the idea that based off of the assumption that we're going to be discriminated against or the awareness of certain stereotypes, we're more likely to behave in a certain way. So... If I'm aware that uh, men are more likely to uh, interrupt uh, conversations uh, uh, than uh, women and uh, more likely to talk over women, I might go, oh, no, I definitely don't want to do that. But then 
what might happen is I'm more likely to do that. If I'm aware that as a person of color, I tend to score poorer on academic achievement tests, I might accidentally score lower. The awareness of a specific stereotype creates a situation in which you're likely to act out that stereotype. So you're probably wondering, how do we fix this? Well, there are two things that we can focus on. One, contact and desegregation, right? If the only people who you ever know and the only people who you're ever friends with are people who look and behave and have, uh, like you and have the same interest as you, you're going to think that that is normal and you're not going to be able to accept other things as readily, right? The more contact you have with other people, the more desegregated uh, your school and workplace and neighborhood are, the more likely you are to encounter other people who are different than you. And the more you realize that other people who are different are more similar than they are different, right? They might have preferences for different types of music and food and things like that, but you'll be like, oh, this, this food is delicious and this song is great, right? The more contact you have with people who are different, the less likely you are to be prejudiced and discriminatory. Because if you know lots of people who don't fit a stereotypical mold, you're less likely to stereotype. Also what helps is cooperation and interdependence. The more you depend on people who are different than you, the more you rely on them, the better opinion you're going to have of them, right? If I've never met anyone from, uh, I don't know, pick a country, right? Uh, so you have your country in mind. Uh, mine is Belgium, right? Uh, but the um, uh, my teacher, my teaching assistant is... Uh, Belgian, uh, and they help me with my grading and organizing my class, right? If I depend on this person, then I'm going to have a better opinion of all people of that culture, right? Uh, so by working with each other and by having this level of interdependence, we're increasing our appreciation of other cultures. One of the greatest things about globalization, this global interdependence is it's very hard to be racist from a like business or economical perspective when your country depends on the well-being of another country, right? If China's economy were to tank, then American manufacturing and American industries will be negatively affected, like severely affected. If Canada and Mexico were to go under, we would be very negatively affected because we have a lot of trade with these countries. The more we can trade and the more uh, we can share ideas and our cultures, the less likely we are to be prejudiced. If you if think of like your favorite food, uh, and if it's like a food that's specific to your culture, think of a food that is uh, like not a part of your culture, right? If you love that food, how can you hate the people that make that food, right? I love pad thai. Uh, I love uh, oh, just like a nice soft shell carne asada taco, right? Uh, the 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 experiences that we have uh, with other cultures, the more positive ones that we have, uh, the more you watch foreign language films uh, or just anime, uh, or the more uh, exposure you have to uh, different holidays and uh, celebrations, the more likely you are to appreciate the differences. So the one way to solve this is for us to talk more, to share more. Uh, and this is probably the most positive end to a lecture that I've ever had. Uh, this one, it started pretty bleak, but in the end we learned that we can make the world a better place. And you can just start by trying out some new food, right? Uh, so that's where I'm going to end today. Go uh, try, try new things, right? Uh, expose yourself to something new, make new friends, uh, make a pen pal, right?
So that's that's it. Go go be good. Make the world good. Okay. Bye.